But you've got to do it wherever it is people are kind of used to seeing it. Right? Yeah. Fine. There's a new one called Facebook Workplace. I don't know what the hell that is. Okay. Man, what episode are we on? We're getting up there. No, but I know you had like a bunch of topics you wanted to talk about last time that no. we didn't get to. Yeah, this time I really want to talk about... All right, well, we'll just start it out. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Permaculture Smackdown. We don't know what episode it is. Something in the 20s, almost 30. Uh, It's a weekly show with myself, Josiah Wallingford, and... Paul Wheaton, some doofus in overalls. (laughs) Where we just talk about uh, permaculture stuff, community building, uh, news, things that are going on in permaculture. And today, I want to talk about uh, getting ready for winter, because in Montana, at least, we are definitely getting ready for winter. Although we got kind of an Indian summer going on this week, so that's kind of nice. Uh, last week, Davin pulled out some cards and he <laughs> sent them to me and now I have them. There are shitloads of them. Um, I so I just got them yesterday. And so this week I'm going to play them. I might even record us playing it and, uh, and tell you guys what I think about his new game and it'll be unbiased because I have no affiliation, direct affiliation with him. I'm not getting any money for this, but I do get free cards. Um, so I'm going to... I'm going to give a real uh, opinion on the game, and uh, yeah, I'm excited uh, to try it out. I am finally back in Whitefish, Paul. I have been uh, driving around. I've been in Washington. I built these uh, steak sides with Bear Paw. Bear Paw built them. I just filmed and helped him. Um, steak sides for my pickup truck, because I have a fucking okay. pickup truck. Yeah, and uh, they came out sweet. I got my He, he carved in my uh, logo on there. And uh, yeah, do you, a, do you have a picture? I mean, I kind of think that like that kind of thing. We've all built those out of two by fours, <laughs> half a dozen times, right? I bet you've built them out of two by fours a half a dozen times. Yep. I know I've built them out of two by fours a half a dozen times. But if Bear Paw is going to build it, it's going to be something special. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll pull out the photo and I can show that here in a minute because okay. it's loading. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, okay, so we got the cards. Oh, yeah. So I did that with Bear Paw, built some steak sides. I picked up a camper, a truck camper, which you will see at, uh, at the Jamboree, which is coming up very soon. Very excited for that. And uh, I'm going to have to cut down the steak sides to get it to fit. Because what's nice about having a flatbed is that you have all this extra storage space when you have a truck camper. Because truck campers are meant to go into where the sidewalls are for the wheels. Right. And so I'm going to put up my stake sides there and have storage space for the batteries. I'll build a battery box and all that. And I'll probably film it all and everybody can follow along and learn how to build a battery bank for your camper or whatever you want to do or your truck. And uh, I'm going to load up these pictures. Working on it. Yeah, so uh, what else did I do? I went to Canada, visited family. That was awesome. And uh, and then worked on, uh, we got the, as we talk about preparing for winter, we have the winterization course with Michael Jordan on beekeeping. If you're a beekeeper, you got to check out the course. Very affordable. He just gave me a ton of information I have to add to the course. So I'll be doing that this week too. There's well over uh, it's well over the cost of the course worth of materials in there. There's a ton of materials that go in your, he has like a book that he has the students uh, build as they're going through the course. And so there's different modules for different seasons and things. And so they build the book as they're doing the course uh, so that they can t- keep track of what the bees are doing year after year. So they can pass it down to family members, things like that. And so, uh, and so I'm going to be adding all that information. And if you want to check out the course, it's super inexpensive. Uh, okay, so I can share this with you now. I should uh, maybe I should download it. But anyway, <laughs> I see a black screen. Is that all? Oh, wait, there we go. There we go. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So I'm gonna go. I'll download this and just share that. Not, 
it's not solid. It's it's an open thing. Yeah, yeah. Air and, and we, let's see here. Bam. This is just uh, one side of it. There's bear paw. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we got the the Permethos logo here. And uh, this is the boy reaching for the apple. And it says Thrive Through, which is our new branch, the community side of uh, Permethos. And then on the other side, it says uh, uh, Prepare, Survive, Thrive in the same kind of uh, banner there. So there it is. Yeah, it turned out real nice. So somehow uh, it, you dropped out on me. Oh. In fact, the whole uh, Zoom app crashed. Oh, nice. Yeah. I just Everybody else hear me? That's all that matters. We don't care if Paul heard me. Uh, so I, all I was saying is uh, uh, that, so we did the logo here, which is the boy. Our logo is uh, the boy hold it, reaching out for an apple. Like Johnny, we call him Johnny, Johnny Appleseed. And, uh, and then so we did this uh, banner with Thrive Through. I suppose I could zoom in on this. Yeah, so it's got this banner here that says Thrive Through. You, you're looking around like you're not seeing anything. Well, I'm trying to get the little windows up again and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And so I was like, oh, you just keep talking. I'm going to try and get everything repaired. Although <laughs> that doesn't seem to be working either. So, but whatever. Yeah, thrive through. Okay, yeah. So that's the new. Also, it does have sides. It's not just open air. Open air. So, yeah. well, so when I, I thought that when I saw the first picture, it was just you know, um, a stick across the top and the sticks on the sides and that was it. But it, now oh, I no. see <laughs> a bit of a log at the bottom. That, that is pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah. And this is a slab. And so of course, Bearpaw loves slabs. You can go to any mills and they got tons of these slabs in all kinds of different types of wood and uh, they're super cheap and they're awesome. They uses them for steps and all kinds of things, uh, railings and uh, yeah, truck sides. <laughs> And so, uh, yep, that's it. And then on the other side is, I'll get a picture. Oh, I don't, maybe I have a picture of it. No, I'll just share this. It's close enough. I have a bunch of pictures. I just don't have them accessible at the moment for you guys. But that's okay. Uh, stop sharing that. And there we go. So this is uh, Tuesday and Sandy, which is Bearpaw's spouse and myself. Um, so you can kind of see it here, prepare, survive, thrive in the same kind of uh, banners. And got the bear paws. He puts bear paws on the back. So it looks like a bear is pushing the truck. <laughs> and uh, there's prepare, survive, thrive. So Paul is frozen. Awesome. No, oh, I was, it, it, it uh, died again, which is weird because the Zoom app has turned it to be like 10 times better than Skype. And uh, the fact yeah. that it just crapped out is like, oh, no. Did you close all your browsers and your browser windows? I'll usually do you do that before you do the show. No. Yeah, usually. But um, at the same time, I kind of need to have the browser window open mm. in order to be able to activate the show. Yeah. <laughs> well, all I was saying was he put uh, these bear paws in the back. So like the bear is pushing the truck. Oh, all yeah. right. <laughs> and then prepare, survive, thrive in the same uh, banners. And it turned really good. Is the wood treated so, in any way? Yes, I had to put varnish on it because I was going in the, into Canada. And uh, they will not accept wood, you know, bring it raw wood up there. You have to have it varnished or treated in some way, oiled. Uh, I think it has to be varnished. I don't even think I could just oil it. I think that was something that we wanted to do was just oil it, but it wasn't good enough. Because ah. they don't want bugs. They want bug-free wood going into their country. Because there's no other way these bugs are getting into Canada. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and he happens to live like five miles from the border. Uh, anyway, yeah. So it turned out really nice. Um, I'm going to have to cut off right here. I'm going to have to cut these off and reshape them so that the truck camper edge can go over it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now, like, what's the what's the nearest town? 
if he's like that close to the border, I mean, is or there's a town called Oroville up there. That's that's fairly close. Republic, I think, is the closest town. The closest town is actually considered a ghost town now, okay. uh, but, but Republic would be the nearest. Because yeah. Ernie and Erica live really close to Oroville. Yeah, we were going to meet up with them, and that fell through. I can't remember why. Okay. But uh, for the fire, there was a fire in Oregon. They went to go firefight. Right. Where right. Erica did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we were going to meet up with them. Yeah, because we get to go there quite a bit, and they live pretty close. All right, so I have uh, now officially shut off all of my, my browser stuff, so. Good, in, now you can in, hear me maybe. <laughs> in theory, it, it, it will now run better. Um, stress out my computer less. Cool. So what have you been up to besides uh, recovering from horrible pains? Oh, um, <laughs> oh I've been writing a lot. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but we're getting ready for the uh, the innovators event, which I, that hasn't taken very much of my time. It's a bit. so um, Fred and the Boots have been working hard at getting Allert and Abby prepared for because uh, part three, because the uh, the jamboree is in three parts, and part three is that is up at Allert and Abby, and uh, it's going to be a uh, a rocket cook stove and oven. That Peter Vandenberg is going to, and he's going to step through the whole design process, as well as the actual build, and that's that's in part three. So um, you were with me up there uh, looking at it, and we were kind of like uh, uh, in this whole position of uh, um, what should we do to improve this structure. So yeah. there were a couple of things about the structure that were kind of like because uh, like two of the posts. Had, had sunk. And so we realized that when building a Wafati, it's important to take the excavator and go around and push down on each of the posts as much as you can before building the rest of it. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we didn't do that. And so we, you know, we learned our lesson uh, and it's kind of like, all right, so we need to do things to make sure that these posts don't sink any further. Uh, plus it has changed some things because these two posts have sunk down. Now we've had uh, two different people who were who, who were living up at the lab for a short while, and they were like freaking out, like no one should go in there because it's going to collapse at any moment. And I went up and I looked at it and I thought, no, it's perfectly safe. It's just changed a little bit, just slightly. I mean, I do think that these two posts have sunk probably five inches, five and a half inches which is mm -hmm. pretty significant, but it's like the building is done extremely well despite that. So, but I did think like, okay, let's, let's shore these points up just to be sure. And we so what we did was, is when those posts were sinking on um, the top of the roof, did kind of push the posts out a little bit. So what we did is we straightened the post back up to perfectly vertical and uh, we've done a couple of other things. So anyway, the, the structure is being reworked to make it be, um, at 100% by the time that uh, the uh, work is going to be done there with Peter Vandenberg's uh, new designs. So there's been about two weeks work done there. I've gone up a few times to guide a couple of things, um, but it's, you know, uh, the, the boots and Fred are up there right now. Making Still those going, things. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. slow, but it's almost done. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, I think I think that they they might even today be putting the uh, straw bale wall back in, um, but you know, it's it's so there's been uh, um, two posts have been moved uh, that that had gone in a bit, and then there's a lot of um, wood that's been put on along the the bottom to help prevent the posts from sinking any further and to add some structural stability. Um, and then there was uh, one point where we were kind of thinking like um, this, this, uh, this one post has a crack in it. And it's like, is it superficial or is it more than superficial? And we thought, let's just shore it up just to be sure. So it's been shored up. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. There was another one where it's like, boy, there's a lot of weight on that one point. Um, it looks like it's going to be fine. It looks like it's holding fine. But let's shore it up too, just to be sure. So that is now shored up. Um, we just wanted to make sure that the building was, I mean, 
when I looked at it, it looks structurally sound, but it's like. You want people to feel comfortable in it. Yeah. 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 And there were like and those two people kind of freaking <laughs> out and like, oh, it should be burned to the ground. It's unsafe. So we were up there with experts and, and kind of like, no, it's not unsafe. It's, it's okay. But we could shore it up a bit just to be sure. The other thing is, is I, I really feel like of all the projects we've got going on right now, uh, this is the highest priority project. Um, we need to test the annualized thermal inertia. Um, and so we, we won't be able to test it this year, but we, uh, we can get some indicative results this year. Uh, the real test will be, will be next year. And, and it would be good to have somebody who might live in it uh, year round. Um, but that's, that's our next big test. But we do, we do need to finish it. We do need to finish it. And the structure, um, even before we started with any of this, it, it wasn't finished. Um, you know, the, the cob had not been put on the um, uh, exterior walls yet. And so then there was, there was air moving through it. So we need to mitigate that. Yeah. Now, when you were doing, when you were doing these uh, uh, enhancements, did you have to remove the soil from the roof? No. Okay. No. That would have been huge. Yeah. We, we talked about, um, <clears throat> yeah, that would, have, that would have been a huge, huge task. Uh, but we talk, it is very heavy under there. At the same time, when we started, it was like after, you know, a two and a half months of no rain. And it's like, it's dry soil. It's going to weigh a hell of a lot less. Then when it started to rain, we're like halfway through one post and we're about to start on, on, this, on another post. And um, Fred threw a tarp over the roof. Like, let's, mm. let's keep it dry right. so it's a little, a little easier to work with. Yeah, all right. Now, you didn't use concrete footings. And is, that, is there a reason for that? Are you against concrete? I'll say the short answer is yes. Okay. I mean, you think there's, there's a bunch of reasons to not use concrete. We avoid the use of cements as much as we can. But like when you're making a rocket mass heater, then um, it's kind of, because like a lot of the environmental impact of using cement and concrete, because uh, it comes from the Portland cement process, is that um, it's something like, uh, like one third of the, uh, I'm sure I'm saying this wrong. It, it consumes an enormous amount of energy in order to be able to process it. It, it. it heats it up. And then at the same time, my understanding is there's an enormous amount of carbon dioxide that comes out. So the, the process of just making cement is, is a huge environmental impact. Um, and then once you've got it in place, it, it's got a low toxicity. It's not very toxic, but it is a low toxicity. And it would be better to use less of it. Plus, the other thing is, is that I like the idea, can we try to travel a path in such a way that, that we could build structures without importing materials? Right. That's and, what I was going to say is my big, my big thing, is that you have to bring all this extremely heavy materials from outside of your area usually unless you have some quarry on your property i mean you even if you do, it's, i think that in order to make cement i've never tried to make cement and i've only read a little bit but i kind of feel like it's one of those things where i think you have to get it up to a really high temperature there's mm -hmm. something you have to do no i don't think so it's a bit like slaking lime or something like that but it's like well, if you go to a quarry and you get a bunch of rocks you still have to grind it down that's the probably what you're okay. thinking. I don't think you have to heat anything up, but you do have to, that takes a lot of energy to grind okay. it all up. Yeah. All right, so now you got sand, now right. what? And now you got to mix in water and uh, uh, okay. what else? Now you got a beach, what's, what's that? What else do you need? <laughs> now you're looking it up, you're cheating! Look at what? you! I'm not allowed to look it up? So you need Portland cement. Everything you've mentioned so far is an aggregate. Look, Julia is saying yeah, yes, you quite a bit. Right. there is mm. embedded energy. That's why it gets hot when you add water. Ha! See, I told you so. But you're not heating it up. It's just heating up on its own. The Portland cement, it, it's okay. a chemical reaction. Oh, okay. And you need, to, you need to put the energy in, and then the Portland cement then gets mixed with water. It then has a chemical reaction. 
and is going to then make it be, you know, hard like it is. And so the stuff you're talking about would be the aggregates. What's going to be your aggregate? All right. So all I'm saying is, is that we avoid it. I mean, it's kind of like, hey, look at us. We're off grid. And here's our collection of propane tanks. And it's kind of like, if you're using propane tanks, you're not really off grid. I, I, and, and so I kind of feel like if you're using wood to heat and wood to cook and, and, you know, wood for your energy, then that's off grid. But propane is not off grid. I mean, it's not like you walk out into the woods and like, look, there goes some propane right over there. Do you see it? Quick, get a bucket. You're not paying attention to me. You're reading the thing about how to make cement. <laughs> All right, so it's lime, basically, is what Portland cement is. is Slaked uh, lime. Multiple types of lime mixed together. Um, chalk, marble, shell, limestone. Uh, so, so they mix those together, but, yeah, the lime is what's creating the heat. And it's slaked cement. lime, which is heated lime. Okay. Right? And, and that... So it's this, it's, yeah. It's the type of lime. Anyway, interesting. You, you got to have it. It's got to be the kind where you slake it, which is to heat it. It's got to be heated just right. And then that embeds this, this chemical reaction. So in a cement mixer, I mean, they're mixing the raw materials plus this, this concrete mixture, this lime mixture into it. And that's when it creates the heat. Look, Julia's going to tell us all about it. <laughs> all right all right so the, the the key is is that no i do not use cement in there but it's like the other thing is 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 why would you use cement um i mean what's it what's it getting for you i mean you've got a log in the ground and and so the problem that we had was that it sunk five five and a half inches you know after we put it in place Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's like, okay, so now you put mm -hmm. a cement pad under the bottom of it. And it's like, if the cement pad is the same size as the log, then it still goes down five, five and a half inches. Now, if the cement pad is larger than the log, maybe it will only have gone down four inches. So you still have a problem. It's just a smaller problem. Right. Oh, so now, okay, so Julia says, Roman cement was more awesome than ours. Somehow it gets stronger when under seawater. Uh, recently, somebody figured that I can't remember the details. <laughs> okay. <laughs> rammed earth. Now, could you use rammed earth as a, a concrete alternative for, I don't know if you could for structure like that. So rammed earth is something that people are making homes out of. Yeah. And, and so there's, Something to be said for rammed earth. It's, but are they making foundations out of it? I, can't, I don't know the answer to that. I would mm -hmm. suspect that that's plausible. But all right. The thing is, is that we're building a pole structure here. We're, we're not going to have a foundation. I mean, this is part of the Ehler design is, right. is that if you use a pole structure, it, it buys you a lot of things. But of course, there's a lot of places where you can't have a, like here at base camp, yeah, you're not making a pole structure. You just, there's, I mean, it's, it's solid rock. You can't get the poles in the ground. Right. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, modern house building stuff is to, is to pour a foundation and then you build on the foundation. And so then basically everything in your design is about like how you can't get stuff into the ground really, other than your, your foundation. Um, or stone. And, yeah, you can put, you know, people bury stone and put the wood on top of the stone, right? Okay, but that, you know, as a foundation, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then, all right, let's, let's, look at, let's look at some of these bits and bobs. If, I, I, if I'm going to change things, which I've got one, one way that I would change, in, in fact, for Allerton Abbey, the, we called it Wafati 0.7 for a reason. We felt like it, we have a lot of things to learn from this. There was a lot of things, and so then you're, you're sitting there, and over your left ear is Mike Ayler looking at me, you bastard. And so then, so we're talking about an Ayler structure, his designs. And so his design was is that you, you take the, the log, and you're going to the post, and you're going to wrap it in a bunch of uh, black garbage can sacks, right? Those, those bags, the hefty bags. You're going to put a whole bunch of them around the bottom. 
And I never liked that because then any liquid that's still in the log is going to accum accumulate inside that bag. Or if anything spills or something, it's going to end up inside that bag and be held in there and cause rot. And that's a problem. So I kind of feel like the whole concept of, of the bag is not a good one, but he still sticks to that. He still believes. Now, I came up with a variation, and a lot of the people in making uh, Ehler designs have gone with what I've come up with. And that is to not use cement, not use the bag, not char the end, just stick it in the end of the hole, and when you go to refill the hole, mix a little borax in with that. So borax is um, uh, a mined mineral, uh, you know, high in borates. Um, what, did the mousetrap go off? I don't know. What is that noise? Uh, sorry. Go on. <laughs> okay. And, and it's, uh, it's antifungal. And, okay. and so um, now it is toxic, but it's, it's a very low toxicity. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of people treat it like it's non-toxic, but I just want to emphasize it's not non-toxic. So um, it's just very, very low toxicity. So anyway, mix a little bit of that in, and when you get to the top inch, mix a little bit more in as you're refilling your hole. So this is, this is what I've recommended, and a lot of the Ehler structure folks have transitioned to, to doing this. So now here's my, here's my modification. Uh, one, I think I would put some kind of uh, some, some gravel or um, you know, river rock or something like that in the bottom of the hole. Mm -hmm. um, because the reason is, is that there's water in the log and as the water comes down in the log, uh, if you just put it into the dirt and you pack the dirt, it could make it so that that water can't get out of the log. And so by putting gravel or something there, then it's going to make it so that that water can, can get out. An and it, another big thing is bark, right? Removing the bark. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in with bark. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it, got to be a peeled log. And I don't know if the cambium, if you have to remove the cambium as well, um, but, but we do. You do when you're, you're removing the bark. Yeah, well, no, you can remove the bark. You have to strip down a little deeper to get the cambium uh, when, you're, when you're peeling. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I don't know how much moisture it holds, but, but we I do. don't know of anybody who strips off the bark and leaves the inner cambium layer. It looks nice. Like if you're doing something to look nice, the cambium looks nice. Um, but, but I think that it would hold in some I mean, the cambium, I mean, we're talking about the same. It's kind of like a white, spongy material, right? It's kind of like... It's white. It's uh, sticky. No, it, it it's it, well. It depends on the tree. That would be the case for birch, but for like, uh, but for pine, it's kind of a brown. Um, I'll show you. Do, do, do. All right. See. Well, while you're looking that up, I'm going to say that um, it's going to be something where there's no bark. Uh, I think, yeah, maybe maybe I need to, you know clarify on that point but the big thing is is the is to add gravel in the bottom and then plus when you're putting it into the hole you start putting your dirt in and whatnot maybe you're even packing the dirt a little bit you're going to get the excavator over there and you're going to put the excavator bucket on top of the the post and you're going to push down and you're going to you're going to push that log as far down into the ground as you can so we did good. not do that. And so then these problems are from not doing that. <clears throat> now, the other thing is, is where Allerton Abbey is, the, um, the subsoil is kind of, um, kind of, kind of sandy, dusty. I mean, it's a, it's a subsoil. It's definitely, but it's not big rocks. And um, so basically um, I'm kind of thinking like, I, in hindsight, rather than making our holes three, three and a half feet deep, I think I would have gone to five, five and a half feet deep. And, and I think, you know, that would have made things better also in this particular dirt, this particular soil. 
Um, okay, so you can see it's kind of that's bark, and that's a little that's that's the cambium layer, uh, one yeah. of the cambium layers. This is like the main cambium. Oh, uh, that's stripped out right there. But anyway, okay. yeah. I think I think it changes colors for different times of the year, and and so then a lot of times what you want to do is um, knock these trees down. Um, you know, if you want logs, harvest your logs in the early spring, and then the bark almost falls off because what's happening is is it's making a brand new cambium layer, and it's very very delicate, and the bark just almost falls off. Well, also seasoning, because when you season, you know, the, the trees shrink, and that makes the bark pop off. Right. And so, you know, the cool thing about doing all this stuff is not only do we get awesome folks like your dad to come by um, and teach us stuff, um, but there's, there's, you know, a parade of these amazing people coming by and giving advice. So we've had several people that do roundwood timber framing who've stopped by. And so one roundwood timber framing guy, uh, and we've had a lot of timber, a lot more timber framing <coughs> and a few roundwood timber framing. But um, so this, so this one guy was saying, uh, you know, I was talking to him about using green wood when, when building log structures or, you know, doing timber framing in general and how it, you know, shrinks this way, you know, around the log, it, it, it shrinks about 7%. And then lengthwise, it shrinks about 3%. And he said, you know what? When we build stuff, we don't even think about it anymore. We don't even, not, not like, oh, yeah, we're so used to doing that 7%, 3% thing. It's, like, it's more like we don't, even, we don't even calculate for that. It's like so small that it ends up being nothing. And I was kind of thinking like, really? Are you sure? And he's like, absolutely. It, it ends up just not being a thing. Well, I think it's not as big of a deal if the wood is seasoned. Like a, a regular framer is buying processed wood that's been seasoned and everything. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. But if you're getting fresh wood and building with it, you definitely have to worry about it. See, now that's what I thought. And this guy, I mean, he's got a lot of amazing, beautiful timber frame structures under his belt. I mean, and it's, what a portfolio. It's doing fine, huh? And he's got a full team, and this is what they do full time. And he said, they don't think about it anymore. Huh. It doesn't matter what kind of wood it is? I didn't ask him that, but I guess it doesn't matter to him for whatever right. kinds it is that he's got. And, and now he's over in like the, like generally the Seattle area is where he's doing all of his work. So he doesn't have a lot of hardwoods. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. It's probably it's probably all softwoods, which would I would think that would affect it even more. The shrinking. You know, you know one of the first things you learn mm. when working with greenwood is the idea of like uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna build something, and I'm gonna make certain parts of it be seasoned wood and certain parts of it be greenwood, and then as the greenwood shrinks, it's gonna pinch that dry wood because the dry wood's not gonna shrink. Yeah. And then the whole thing the the whole thing gets stronger as mm -hmm. it gets older and yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like "Ooh, that's so cool man now i don't have to use glues and shit but basically this guy kind of poo-pooed all of that huh. when uh you know when we're building like the steak sides for example we definitely think about because all right so it's going into a slot like that big where a two by yeah. four would go in right and you have to think about it getting wet and expanding out because yeah. then you can't get it out of the truck. Right. So, huh. Well, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, I don't know. Uh, anyway, what are you doing for, what are you, what are you doing? What should people be doing in general uh, for, the, for the fall? First of all, what are you doing for, for fall uh, uh, because of the coming winter? Okay. Plants? Um, I, I, I got to, I got to say that, that it's like um, I'm I'm on a twisted path personally, and and it's like every day I hate myself and love myself at the same time. <sighs> so it's kind of like um, 
you know, it's that whole, a few shows back, I talked about how I wish to accomplish 10 times more than Sepp Holzer and, uh, before I die. And, and I realized that in order to do that, I got to have like 20, 30 people. And, and it's like, so we've got to have a strong forward velocity with all these people. And, um, and so it's like, if I spend time doing the direct interaction, which is something I just really want to do, um, and it's what I've always done before, then I can never get past more than doing like 0 0.3 units of sepitude. Um, because of, because Sepp started when he was seven, and I'm much older than that now. <laughs> I might not look it, but I am. You got some catching up to do. And I've only <laughs> been here for four years. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, so if I get if I get a moment where it's like I could go out and mulch, because that's a big thing that I like to do, like the fall. If you haven't mulched everything yet, you better get out there and do it now, because it's like, while the soil still has warmth to it, then uh, now is a good time to pin in some of that warmth. Yep, reduce then, your frost as much as possible. Exactly. And so yeah. then there's a much better chance that when the spring comes and you start planting, that soil will be warmer and, and rare and to go. Plus, uh, certain kinds of rot will have made it so that it's more, it's a, it's a higher quality soil when you get started in the spring. Well, it's food. It's food for all those microbes available to them right away. And then there's that. The, the, you know, basically the thing is you never want to have bare soil anywhere. Um, and then this is also not a bad time. It's a little late to be planting any of your fall crops, but there's still some things that you could plant, uh, you know, for your fall crops, for, for you know, including for building soil. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. That's a, that's a big thing that I think about this time of year. Um, but we are, as we're getting into winter, um, I mean, we're wrapping up the Allerton Abbey project. We've also got a skittable kitchen, um, that has, uh, you know, it's some of its walls and it's got its floor on the skids and the beginnings of roofy bits. And we need to get that ready also for part three. It'll be a skittable canning kitchen that'll be, um, filled out on the inside during part three of the Rocket Mass Eater Jamboree. Um, and so we're working on that. Um, then uh, uh, I, I think that the only note that I've had that's been a big note for this season has been, well, we, we shut off all the water going out to the showers because we've had a, I, I'm not sure if we've had a freeze, but you know, the weather reports are like it could freeze. So we've shut all that down just to be safe. Um, have you had a freeze yet? Uh, not a well, we have uh, we have dew like frost in the morning, but it's it's very minor. But so yeah. I haven't even seen any frost here yet. Yeah, we're I haven't. But it, that doesn't mean it hasn't been here. Um, <clears throat> but of course, you know, the next thing we're talking about is is uh, you know, do we have enough wood to get through the winter? We've got plenty of wood because we bought two cords of wood, and yes, I said bought. <clears throat> we didn't. I mean, we could have just harvested it ourselves, but it's like, oh no, we've got all these things going on. Rather have people working on permaculture projects and then like, you know, get this little cheat, which is to buy two cords of wood. And uh, we got, I think we've got more than half of it left right now. Which, yeah, is fantastic. That was last winter, right? I think we bought it two winters ago. Yeah. And, and that's all because of those rocket masks. I mean, I, in, in a, the conventional stoves here at my place, I'll go through two cords a winter. Okay, which is pretty damn good for Montana. How, how big is your conventional place? Small, uh, it's just one room that I heat. Oh, just it's a single room? Yeah. Okay, now I estimate, and, and I think I've mentioned this in a previous SmackDown, um, I would say that if this house that I'm in right now, which you've been in many times, it's a three bedroom house. Uh, we call it the Fisher Price house because it's, you know, a double white, it's a plastic house. Um, but if you were to have a conventional wood stove in here, then I estimate it would be six cords of wood to heat it through the winter. Whew, now, I think you could get away with four. Well, okay, we don't have winter curtains on any of the windows. Right. We, we don't have storm windows. 
we this is you're thinking like the average family home they want to wear shorts inside whatever <laughs> yeah okay six cords i could see that okay yeah so we this is not this is not a particularly winterized house right and um and then yeah i think most of your families are going to be saying like 72 with um they, like they want to keep while they're in it they want it to be 72 with the occasionally popping it above that for an evening of luxury. Oh well, yeah, that and they're going to work and they want it to be warm when they get home. <laughs> Plus I think a lot of people when they have a conventional wood stove, you'll end up with, with one night a week where it's like they got it up to eighty five and now they're opening up the windows to cool it off. They got it too hot. Right. You know, oops, too hot. Yeah. I, and I then, then in the morning it's gone. Like yeah. it's cold again. They're freezing their nubs off. Yeah. So, um, uh, but it seems to me that for a house of this size and a conventional wood stove, and you don't have that extra winterization stuff, that you would probably do six cords. And what are you doing? We, and last year we carefully, carefully measured and, and did 0 0.6. And last winter was a particularly cold winter. Yeah. So it was on average for the whole winter. It not only did the winter run long, but it it the average day was much colder than what we're used to having. And that's without winter curtains. You you have the the standard yeah. insulation and the Fisher Price. Uh, Absolutely, trailer. all of that stuff. We don't have a mud room to you know coming in at either of the doors. Now, where are you doing your heat lamp thing? You know, having the the uh, light bulb next to you to warm you as well. Does that include that? Well, part of what we did, and and this is an evil cheat, and so I'm coming clean, <laughs> and and now everybody who hates my guts is now going to refute this to the ends of the earth. And that is that um, uh, in my office, of course, I've got my laptop running and it generates heat. Mm -hmm. And I've still got the little, the little 15 watt dog bed heater at my feet, which warms my toes. And I've got this lamp right here. And when it's on, then of course it warms my bald spot. <laughs> I don't think you were bald before you started using that light. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, but I, you know, I would have this stuff on, but even more than that, um, normally throughout the house, I turn all the lights off. I mean, I am a miser with, with the lights. Yeah. Um, but during this experiment, I made an executive decision. And that is that I believe most homes leave a lot of their lights on in the house. 24 seven. Yeah. Uh, definitely living room. I think people were pretty good about turning off the bathroom, like yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, but definitely True. living bathroom room, light. kitchen. And then of course your bedroom light, you'll turn that off. But right. I mean, I've, I've been to houses where it's like they have outdoor lights on 24 seven middle of the day lights are still on. And it's like, that's a floodlight. That's two floodlights. Those are 350 Watts each. That's 700 watts that you've got running. Yeah. You can pay for your wood for the year. <laughs> so <laughs> so part of what we did is we left lights on. And, and for me, this is, it's, it's brutally maddening because, um, because I'm such a light miser and I'm, you know, I'm just used to turning the lights off. And, it, and it's like, you know, when we have company, it's like every time we have company, they all leave all the lights on. And I'm constantly turning them off. And, um, but I felt like in order to make this be a fair test that I need to leave the lights on in order to be a fair test. So I did do that. And, um, and still, and I felt twisted. I felt really twisted about doing that because technically that's heat. That's extra heat. Right. But I kind of felt like, all right, would it have been 0 0.7 cords or 0 0.8 cords if if I turn those lights off? I'm I'm not sure. Still less than a cord is great. Yeah, yeah, but I'm it's like I'm I'm conflicted on this one. All right, and and but there you ask the question. I'm trying to be straight and say now. The other thing to add to that is is that. Um, 
I, there's, a, there's a thermometer in the kitchen, which is probably 10 feet away from the barrel of the rocket mass heater. That's what I was just going to say. That's very close to the living room Mac rocket mass heater. And so what I've been doing, what I did all last winter is I was checking that thermometer a lot. And so whenever I felt cold, then I would go and see what the temperature was. And uh, usually I found that when it's 68, I was like, whatever. Um, and I mean, but I was also, I was wearing more clothes too. It was wintertime. You, yeah. you put on wool and whatnot, right? So, um, but I found that when it got to be around 66, I got too uncomfortable and I wanted to, I wanted to fire up the rocket mass heater. And then um, by watching this thing, I learned that usually at about 70 degrees, um, and, and you would th it's not like I'm planning it, not like I'm like, okay, and at 70, I'm gonna stop feeding the fire. No, it's, it's more like at 70, I forget to feed the fire. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's more organic than that. So um, we did, it's, so it's not like, like in a house in a con with a conventional wood stove, if it at nighttime got down to, uh, I think a lot of people with conventional wood stoves, it gets below 50 at night inside the house. Some people are getting up at two o'clock in the morning to start Smoke the fire it. again. Yep, yep. And, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, so they'll wake up in the morning and it's damn cold. And so we're waking up in the morning and it's plenty warm because the mass has been given off heat all night long. Right. Um, so, uh, um, I'm saying that we kept it at 66 and above all winter. Nice. And so I'm thinking that it's, it's far more luxuriant, far more comfortable than a conventional stuff. So now if I own a Fisher Price home and I wanna put one of these things in my home, what do I gotta worry about with support? For, yeah. Because they weigh a lot. They and do. Fisher Price homes aren't really meant to hold that much weight in one area. Oh, absolutely. We, we, we went underneath and we shored it up in like um, eight different spots. And so with you know, wood. it's, it's um, uh, um, yes, it's all, it's all wood on cement blocks. So we got like a, a, a cement pier kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's, we, we measure the distance and then we put a bit of wood in there and tacked it in so mm -hmm. it won't move. And, um, but the idea is, is that when the, when the weight is on with the rocket mass heater, there's support underneath it to hold that up. So, you know, it's, it doesn't crash through the floor. I just got this, uh, this truck camper and it's got a big window and then a seat, a bench seat, and then the thermostat. And I was thinking it'd be so nice <laughs> if that was a rocket mass. But man, that'd be a lot of weight to add to that my truck. Would be a lot of weight, and to it's one like, side of my truck. There's that, and and then like if you're driving your truck around with it on it, mm -hmm. I think you might see your mileage. It, it might dramatically impact your mileage. Not to mention like all kinds of other things with your truck. Like what's it going to do to your suspension? Right. right. Yeah. No, no, we're talking about, we're talking about a lot of weight. So what do you think? What would you recommend? Just a conventional? If I want wood, which I do. A wood heat. What do you think? Okay. Um, I mean, this is one of the, so part two of the rocket mass heater jamboree is the innovators event. And so we've got five innovators that are going to be here and um, uh, they just start bouncing ideas off of each other like crazy and they're redesigning. So, so the cool thing is, is they usually arrive several days before the event starts. And already they start exchanging stuff and talking about now. What about this? And what about that? And what about? Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. And so, um, one of the projects that's happening in part one of the jamboree is that we're going to build a rocket mass heater in the love shack, and so that's tinier than a tiny house. Mm -hmm. um, but at a previous event, Tim Barker said that he, what he wanted to do was um, to make like a hot water tank. And then he even wanted to set it up so that the hot water tank was sitting outside and was super insulated. And that inside there would be a radiator and it would be a, 
a passive system. So then the, the hot water and the, and the tank would then rise into the radiator, which would then put the heat in the room, which would cool that water, which would then go down. So then the water would be moving naturally between the tank and that radiator. Mm -hmm. And then he's thinking like having the hot water tank. So it would be all outside. You would, you would heat it outside. You would fire it up outside. And then um, the heat would go inside gradually. So you'd have all that benefit of the mass and it taking a long time, but the mass would be outside. And then he said, if you've, because of course the love shack is on skids, you can move the love shack around wherever you want. He says, no problem. Just drain the tank, pop it inside, and then head on down the road. Right. So that. Well, yeah, I'm thinking about a lot of, so the, the reason people get truck campers or a lot of people, at least hunters, is for hunting. And so they want to not have to rely on propane um, because maybe they want to hunt for a couple of weeks. And so they all have these truck campers and they put regular stoves inside of their camper, which is fine for a small area for a small amount of time. It's fine to be in a little inefficient. Um, but there's a lot of people also building tiny homes that are on trailers, things like this, and they're driving around. Um, this is becoming more and more popular. And I'm thinking, all right, so everything that runs propane in a camper or a tiny home is you got your stove top, your oven, your hot water heater, and your uh, thermos, your heat. And so how would you make a system that could do all of those things in a small area that's got to be mobile on a vehicle? Uh, I, I just don't know if it's feasible to do something other than either a conventional, you, you know, propane with something else, a conventional wood heat. So, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, another thing about this idea um, is, is that it could even be inside. Um, and, and of course, what you want to, what would be, what would be nice is to be able to burn wood inside because that's far more comfortable to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you just want to load the wood outside from the outside and then access it from inside. That's a possibility too. But um, all right, but the other thing is, is I was going to say hot water. Mm -hmm. And um, a big thing that we had here uh, for the uh, appropriate technology course last year, so a little over a year ago, um, is that when um, Tim built that hot water heater, that was the first one, then I came down and I asked him about it. I said, okay, so what strategy are you using to compensate for Legionella issues? And um, he didn't, he basically didn't have one. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, and there's, there's a couple of different things that you could do. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure you've seen like solar hot water systems, like the drawings for them. And um, sometimes what they do is it's like, okay, here's a big barrel and it's full of water and we heat that water. And then that's the water you use for hot water. And then there's other ones where it's like, here's a barrel full of hot water. And then there's the, the water you're going to use is going to be like a coil going through it. See? Okay, the bottom right, there's the ones with the coils. I'm not sure if that's exactly it, but, if, but basically the, the water that you use, I'm not sure if this is maybe not, maybe. All right, the key is, is that the water that you use is different than the water that goes up to the solar panel. And then um, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, that's just a bunch of government nonsense. You don't have to do that. And it's like, well, well what they're doing there is that um, if you're using water from the tank, and like, let's say you're going to go take a shower, you've got a three gallon per minute shower head, you're going to take a 10 minute shower. Then, then that's 30 gallons coming through. And let's say uh, because it's a solar system and it's cooled off a little bit, you're using 20 gallons of water from your solar tank 
and you're using um, 10 gallons of water that are direct from your well. And so the issue is, is that if the solar hot water hits a certain temperature, like at about 115 degrees, it becomes this perfect uh, Legionella bacteria incubator. And, uh, and so then, um, and it's, it, it, it will double its size, double its population in six hours. And so then it's like, you know, here, if, if, if you've got a couple of days that have gone by, you've got a lot of Legionella bacteria. Somebody's going to get really sick. And so uh, it's like, okay, well, how do, you, how do you beat that? Well, if you've got a coil going through the hot water, and so then your pressurized water goes into the coil, does a loop-de-loop, -loop, and then uh, comes out to your shower, generally that's like, that only holds like, uh, something between a quart and two quarts. So it's, it's kind of like the first 10 to 15 seconds of your shower. Right. And the rest of your shower is going to have no Legionella in it. Or the amount of Legionella is so trivial, it won't, it won't hurt you. It's getting quick heated as it goes through the pipe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, look, we've got lots of people saying things in the, in the chatty bits. Well, Brian says uh, it's onto a different subject a little bit about right. heating a slab. Okay. So um, uh, the, the thing is, is that now you've minimized your Legionella exposure. And so that's a strategy. And so then the thing that, that Tim Barker did, because he started getting really upset that I was bringing this up when he's in the middle of his build. And, and I just thought that he would have immediately thought of doing something for Legionella because it's a big issue if you're going to do solar hot water any of the alternative hot water stuff even if you have a regular water tank you're a dumb fuck to lower the temperature on your water tank a lot of people are like oh i'm saving energy and i'm totally green it's, it's like spending more to heat it up again fucking sick yeah. and, and so it's like the temperature on your water heater needs to be set at 140 degrees if you want to save energy use less hot water okay don't turn that down. 140 degrees will kill the Legionella bacteria. And so it, it basically sterilizes the water. Um, I think, you know, long enough at 130 will work too. But, I mean, there's all these variables that come into play. So you're almost treating it like an on-demand hot water heater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's exactly, that's, that's, that's very much what's going on. But we do have like a big gob of hot water. And then as the water comes in that you're using and it gets heated, then it, it cools the, 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 the water, outside water that's in the tank. Yeah. So it's like, that's only going to last a little while. And then it's going to be like, you know, it's never going to get warm enough. And then you got to go heat it up again. So uh, a lot of times too, like when you have these dual systems like that, people will put stuff in that other water um, to make it so that it doesn't expand and contract as much or, uh, holds the temperature longer or whatever. <clears throat> um, and I'm not familiar with all of that stuff. Yeah. But I, I do know that, you know, if you're doing hot water and it's an alternative system, you've got to be really careful with the Legionella because you can make people really sick. So just at the very least, be aware of, of what makes Legionella happy and then work to making Legionella sad. Yeah, I imagine a lot of people would add things like chlorine, stuff like that to their water to kill it off, which, ugh. I mean, that won't even work. That doesn't mm. even work. It wouldn't even kill it. So yeah. it's like uh, the Legionella tends to hang out inside of single-celled organisms like amoebas. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, so then the chlorine hits the amoeba and the amoeba goes, erk, and then the then, and then the Legionella is like, chomp, chomp, chomp. This guy tastes even better now. <laughs> and, and, then, and then the chlorine dissipates, and now you've got water with Legionella in it. Right. And, then, and then they start reproducing. Um, and, and then it's like, okay, let's say you keep the temperature at 115, and you go on a two-week vacation, and when you come back, you're going to take a shower. And it's like you're, you're soaking in Legionella. The, the other thing about Legionella is, is that um, – uh, if you drink it, not a problem. If you take, um, well, I'm not going to, well, the, the key is, is showers. It's, it's the water vapor. When the Legionella is in the water vapor, you breathe it in, it gets in your lungs, 
And I think I remember 80% of pneumonia is caused by Legionella bacteria. Oh, no kidding. So like Jocelyn's grandmother was, had, had pneumonia. And, and once you get it once, it's so easy to get it again. Well, and she was getting it over and over. It was like she'd get over it in the hospital, and she'd come home, and she'd get it again. And she'd... So then um, I, I just said, I'll bet her water heater is set to like 110 or 115. And so somebody went to her house and checked, and sure enough, it was. And mm -hmm. they turned it up to 140, and she never got pneumonia again. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, we got uh, zero minutes left, and one. I just want to get a quick answer for Brian's question here. What if you have a cement slab? Could you incorporate the rocket mass heater by cutting out a section of slab and building down into the hole so you're integrated with slab to help transfer heat throughout slab, or would that be overkill? So he's basically, if he's got a concrete slab already poured, could you build a rocket mass heater into it? I guess, but the problem is you would have to cut a huge area for the piping out of that slab too. But I guess you could just fill it back in with concrete. Okay, I, I think that you could use a rocket mass heater to do a heated floor. And um, naturally, I'd like to suggest a cob floor rather than a cement floor. But I also kind of feel like for a lot of people, we're talking about people that are at level zero, level one, level two, and the idea of them having a cob floor is crazy to them. So it's like, okay, all right, let's say it's, let's say it's cement. It's just what people are going to do. So in which case, it's like um, you could have your, your rocket mass heater and then a duct that goes out under the cement, does a loop, and comes back. And then, um, and then goes out. And so then you could heat underneath the cement slab, you know, so that underfloor heating. There's a lot of people that have done underfloor heating with rocket mass heaters, but it's, it's not a, a lot, because a lot of people do uh, underfloor heaters and it's um, uh, a liquid. It's yeah, a usually it's water, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, uh, so, but instead of that, then we would be using the exhaust. And then the, the cement slab could be a mess. Now, I just gotta say real quick, um, some people have tried to use uh, cement in certain parts of a rocket mass heater, and I got to say that cement, Portland cement, spalls at 600 degrees, and, and we're trying to go, we're trying to touch into the 3,000 degree range, which also, by the way, melts almost all of your metals. So it's kind of like, um, don't, you know, so, so uh, cement won't work when it's close to the fire, but cement works great when you get to that area where it's like trying to, like the, uh, when you go into the mass, by then your, your highest temperature should be about 350 degrees. And cement will be fine with that. It won't crack. That's a big problem, right? You're going to get cracks if it cement heats up too, too much. So the closer it is, it's going to start cracking. Well, I mean, it's kind of like um, uh, if it's a giant slab, and you're going to be changing the temperature a lot, then, then yeah, you're probably going to see some cracks. But it's also going to depend on, like, how much mass is there between the duct and the top of the cement. Mm -hmm. All right? So, like, if, if, you're, if that top two inches of cement is being heated to, like, 110, which it probably wouldn't, I would imagine that, you know, if you do it right, you might be, like, it's, it's like, 85 you know, so it, in which case it's not going to, it's not going to crack. But if you're talking about having it be something um, uh, where it's like uh, right next to that area where it's getting to be uh, uh, 350 degrees, it's possible. Now, the other thing is, is that um, I, I, I like to see someday a shippable core and I've, put out a design and I haven't built it myself and I haven't been able to get anybody else to build it, but it's using a lot of that um, uh, ceramic fiber board mm -hmm. um, that handles the very high temperatures. And so then the ceramic fiber board is the core and then it's got fire bricks on one end and then it's ceramic fire fiber board, the rest of it. And then, uh, um, and then uh, a cement and perlite mix around that. Now I'm, I'm curious about how, what, how it does. I'm just curious how it does. I mean, if you've got enough aggregate that is like a fiber aggregate 
And some of these are using stainless steel needles and they're not actual needles. They're kind of a weird little jiggly shaped thing, but they call them needles as an aggregate. Um, I kind of think that that would uh, very much minimize the amount of um, cracking there might be. But I'm curious to see how something like that would work because of course, Portland cement is crazy cheap. And light. And yeah, I was just thinking about how light it is and, and like using uh, lava stone or something like that. Maybe it would be, because if you're going to be shipping it, that's going to be a huge amount of cost. See, now I'm kind of thinking that you could make a shippable core with a materials cost of under a hundred bucks and it would be relatively light. Like the whole thing might weigh 40 pounds. Okay. Yeah. For the core. And, and uh, because it's a lot of perlite. Uh, perlite would be the primary aggregate. Um, and it's even possible that somebody could go a step further and get one of those cement foaming machines. Mm -hmm. and, and that would probably be even lighter still. And um, I, would, I would imagine that you could, and, this, and I'm thinking this includes the manifold. And so I'm just kind of thinking that this system would, would ship really well, have less than $100 in materials cost, could probably, if you built 10 of them all at once, you could get to the point of building maybe five a day or something like that. And I think that, that these would be, you could probably sell them for about 500 bucks a pop, including shipping. Um, and so you could tell people these are $500 to your door. And I know that demand would be massive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I just, and so this was, I, in DVD three of my eight DVD set, uh, it's all about shippable cores. And I just, I, I keep hoping that people are gonna start up all these businesses and, and make these cores and try them and, and ship them um, and, and stuff like that. Um, there are some new shippable cores out there that I haven't looked at yet. There have been some in the past that I looked at and I kind of thought, uh, and so, there were things I didn't like, and, and one of the manufacturers, I was like uh, talking about shippable cores on Permies, and one of the man manufacturers decided to call me out on my site and say, why haven't you reviewed our product? And um, our product is awesome. And I started pointing out the things that I'm concerned about with their product, and they just got super pissed and stopped talking to me. So, um, um, I guess I've, I've, I've heard that there's a new one out and I haven't, and I need to take the time to go and look at it. Um, but uh, I haven't, I, I so far I haven't seen anything and I, I should go look at the one that I haven't seen yet, but, but you know, I haven't seen anything that is like, oh yeah, that is awesome. I want to get it here for the innovators event and have the innovators play with it. Right. I haven't seen one like that. All right. We're out of time, man. Well, I uh, got one more that maybe you can answer because it's. I got a question about that too, or it's a similar one. So Julia asks, "What about gravel or and paving stones? But gravel especially when you're doing rocket mass, the, can the mass have air pockets in it? Is that fine? Because that's what gravel would give you as much air pockets." Well, all right. So um, when we talk about the the leading innovators in the world that are going to be here, I don't count myself among them. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm the guy that came up with the pebble style rocket mass heater. And so we use, um, uh, uh, you know, pebbles. So like the one in the, the one that's here in the Fisher Price house, the one in the office and the one down in the, uh, the shopatorium, those all three are pebble style rocket mass heaters. And, and so they use a, you know, pebble about that, that big and they're just filled with pebble style gravel just out of, okay. uh, and um and you're not filling those with anything filling them with the pebbles i mean yeah it's just pebble you're not putting well, any kind of right so normally with your cob style rocket mass here your, your cob mass um then what happens is is that the heat goes into the duct and then the duct is being touched by the cob and the cob conducts the heat away from the duct mm -hmm. um with pebble style, then uh, the heat comes out of the duct, but there's air between the rocks. So 
there's going to be a few pebbles that are going to to actually touch the duct and they're going to get heated a little bit by being conductive but but most of the heat transfer is going to be um, uh, from the from heating the air that's there so it's going to be convective mm -hmm. a convective transfer but the thing is, is that the air has to be able to move through the system. If the air doesn't move through the system, then all that air that's trapped acts as insulation. And so you can't have that. The air has to move through the system in order for the pebble style stuff to work. Now, for a while, Ernie was very insistent that pebble style is shit. And that was before we tested it. And, and so I, I have to point that out because Pebble Style is my design and it's worked out fucking awesome. It's, now granted, it's not as good as Cobb. Uh, I, think, I think that Cobb is going to be about 20 to 30% better. Um, but Pebble Style has turned out to be pretty damn good. And uh, um, the, the, the Pebbles, uh, like if, let's, say, let's say I, wanna, I don't want to have a rocket mass heater in my house anymore. No big deal. It could be taken apart and moved out of the house in about two hours. Um, all those pebbles, just go in there with a shop back and suck them out. You know? And we've done it. We've, we've had pebble-style systems in a location, and we decided to take it out and load it into a truck. About, and, in fact, the one time I'm thinking of it, uh, I think it was um, about an hour and a half to take it apart and load the whole rocket mass heater into a truck. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then it took us, and we went to a local park. It was Earth Day, and we, we rebuilt it. But then we were, like, trying to build it in under an hour, and we hit an hour and ten minutes. <laughs> so this is a, you know, some people call right. it an affordable rocket mass heater. Right. Um, but uh, it's, it's – some people try to make a rocket mass heater they can put on a trailer, and I'm kind of thinking, like, well, that better be a really stout trailer. Uh, having, having a good time over there? That's my phone. Okay. Uh, that's my ringtone. All <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. That's a good place to end on. Uh, so Jamboree is just in about two weeks. It's the 6th of so October. Is part one. And some people, one. and right now we got a special for just part two and part three because we got a lot of people coming to part one and not a lot of people coming to part two or part three. I think there's only like, I think there's only like, uh, nine people maybe that are have like bought tickets to, to uh, part two and part three um, and well, so it's a lot of time to take off work and they want to be there in the beginning I guess but I would think the end would be really cool they would all be really cool <laughs> yeah well I mean part two is the innovators event and so right. it's like part of what we need is to move rocket mass heater stuff forward and it's the innovation section that's critical to like what's going to be the future of rocket mass heater stuff. And we need it to move forward. And so then the whole idea of the format of this year is, is that we hope that people would buy a ticket to part one and part two or part two and part three or the whole event. And then what we need is bodies there for part two. And then we tried to make the ticket really, really cheap for part two. Um, and, and basically, I mean, we're feeding everybody. We're feeding all the help. We're feeding all the innovators and feeding all the students. And it's mm -hmm. like, that's a lot of bellies. And it's like, holy shit, we're going to, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a tight squeeze. So um, it would be great if a bunch of people bought a ticket for part two and only part two and would come and, and help the innovators. I mean, basically, it accelerates the innovators work and what they're working on, the more people we can have there for it. So I'm not sure how well, how good of a job I did. I, maybe I need to change it a little bit next year to try and get more emphasis on, on part two. Uh, part one, uh, you know, we've, we've sold a lot of tickets. Um, so I think that the big thing that we want to be able to do now uh, in fact, right now, uh, I've got a super sweet price for people that have signed up for part two and three. So um, if you look at the uh, the page for that, I can't remember what exactly the price is, but, you know, that's, that would give you a little bit more time to, to get your ducks in a row to come out. There, there it is. Oop, there it is. 700 bucks. So, um, 
so that's, uh, let's see, part two is five days. And part, that's nine days. So it's, it's less than $100 a day. And uh, part three, I think part three has got some pretty cool stuff. Um, the, the, I mean, Alderton Abbey could be classified as a tiny house. It's only 400 square feet. And um, uh, they're going to put that rocket cook stove and oven in there. And then, of course, the skittable canning kitchen. Those are the two bigs for uh, part three. And then part two is the innovators event, which is like we have no idea what they're going to try and build. Usually they get together and they bicker for days about what they're going to do. And they change their mind six times before they build something. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Julia's uh, husband is going to be here. Uh, I think uh, her husband's giving a ride to one of the innovators. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, so we'll be here for the full event. Um, but, and I think that the nine people or so are all pretty much here for the full event. Also, someone, uh, if you're watching and you're from the Kalispell Whitefish area, someone had actually emailed me wanting a ride to the innovators event. Uh, I can do that now. I thought I was going to be out of town, and I'm not. I, can, I am going to be in town, so if you need a ride, uh, no problem. I'll get you over there. And are you still bringing us down some TP poles? Uh, I don't, oh, yeah, I can pick those up for you. I can't, uh, but I, I'm not getting them from where I wanted to get them. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. Yep. Fine. Just, just coordinate with Fred. All, All right. right. So my Patreon thing, uh, people, the people that were watching their comments here, there, some of them are from your empire and some of them are from my Patreon account. And so I'm, I'm glad to see my Patreon peeps there. I recognize at least two of the names. Um, and there's two Bryce's. Maybe one Bryce is my Bryce. One Bryce is your Bryce. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I, uh, uh, I think it's a pretty sweet deal. I think it's a pretty cheap deal. To, if yeah. you're in my Patreon account at all, uh, I think some people may, might end up getting charged more than $1 in a month. Um, and, and you get access to, to Paul and myself, and you can ask questions. And, yeah, it's a great deal. Yeah. And then there's the live questions. Oh. There's the live questions, and then a lot of times at the end of the show, then uh, we stick around for another 10 minutes and answer a couple more. Which we're going to do. So bye to everybody else. If you're a Patreon supporter or a Permethos supporter, stick around. We're going to chat some more. Bye, everybody. <laughs>